Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Doug Maynard. I'm the Associate Director at CAFC, the Canadian Association of Pediatric Health Centers, and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you to this webinar. Uh, today's webinar is titled uh, Caring for Kids New to Canada, and uh, it's, uh, it's, my, it's going to be a great presentation uh, where we're bringing a couple of presenters uh, from Ottawa and from Toronto. Uh, before we get into the presentation, I want to go over a couple of the ground rules for this session. Uh, uh, for those of you who've, uh, this is a repeat for those of you who have been on our webinars before, uh, but our webinars are usually 90 minutes long. We record the entire webinar and occasionally if we have a particularly lively discussion, we might go past that 90 minutes by a few minutes. You are free to come and go as you please. It doesn't interrupt the session at all. And because we were we are recording it, any pieces that you miss, you can always go back and catch those, uh, those pieces that you might have missed. Uh, we do uh, post the recording and any other resource documents, PDFs of the uh, PowerPoint presentations or anything else that the presenters are, are able to share with us. Uh, we do post on that Knowledge Exchange Network, which you can always find at uh, ken.cafc.org. That's uh, www.ken.cafc.org. It usually takes me a couple of days to get that information up uh, onto the site. Uh, but you will receive an automated message from the system that uh, has a direct link that, uh, that will take you there. And uh, with all that out of the way, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our presenters today. Uh, with us today, we have Dr. Chuck Huey, who's a, uh, an associate professor of pediatrics at the University of Ottawa and is a pediatric infectious diseases consultant at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario in Ottawa. Uh, Dr. Huey is a clinician teacher who's actively involved in knowledge synthesis and translation of issues pertaining to children and youth that are new to Canada. And we also have uh, Dr. Tony Berezino, uh, and Dr. Berezino is currently the Director of Community Outreach and Ambulatory Services in the Department of Pediatrics at St. Michael's Hospital. And he formerly served as the Chief of Pediatrics there. And he's, he is also an Assistant Professor in the Department of Pediatrics uh, at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Toronto. And you may recognize Dr. Berezino's name. He's presented at the CAFC conference, I want to say more than once. I, once for sure. He, it might have even been twice. I can't remember. But uh, uh, it is my pleasure to hand the, uh, the virtual uh, podium uh, over to uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Chuck Huey. Well, thank you very much, uh, Doug, uh, for that introduction. And it is really a, is a true honor for uh, Tony and myself to give this presentation. Um, and we we're happy to uh, present to to you uh, our Caring for Kids New to Canada electronic uh, resource and electronic uh, book. When I was driving into work today um, in snowy Ottawa last night, uh, over the night we got about 25 centimeters of snow. I was just reflecting back on, uh, you know, what happens if I was um, a newcomer to Canada? I'd say I was a, a seven, eight-year-old uh, girl or boy from Ethiopia who had just landed maybe in August, and um, they had never seen snow before. You know what? You know, would we? Would they have known about uh, getting boots, uh, snow pants, hats, mitts? You know, should, do they know about uh, driving slowly, even if they have access to a car? You know, so there's many different aspects of uh, care for uh, children and youth uh, new to Canada, um, and in terms of uh, getting to know the system. Right now, what we'll be doing uh, is talking specifically about the healthcare needs and the, the broad determinants of health, uh, but there are many different issues at play here. So over the next uh, 75 minutes or so, uh, this is the outline uh, that we, we will have. Um, we'll, we will be uh, going over um, uh, the heterogeneity uh, of the issues associated with newcomers uh, to Canada. We'll talk about uh, the development of the Caring for Kids New to Canada uh, website, electronic uh, resource, and we'll talk about uh, the medical assessments and specifically about general issues associated with medical assessments. And then we'll give you some concrete actions that you can implement. We really have no conflicts to report, uh, except that both uh, Tony and myself, uh, in addition to many, many others, some of you which might be on the line today, um, have been intimately involved in, with this uh, CKNC project uh, for a long time now. And we really do feel like uh, proud parents uh, when we, we were asked to speak about it. Uh, so this is truly uh, our, our baby and now has uh, grown into childhood. So uh, I'd like to start you off with a, um, 
a, a case. And this is Mario, who is an eight-year-old boy uh, in grade three at a local school. He lives with his mother and his five-year-old brother, who is in junior kindergarten. The family left uh, Colombia one year ago because of uh, the political situation. And uh, Mario's mother works part-time in a donut shop um, and is trying to attend uh, adult language classes to learn English. Uh, Mario's father is still in Colombia and the family really hasn't heard from him uh, for the past nine months. Mario is uh, referred to a community pediatrician or healthcare worker because he's having difficulties with his schoolwork. He's having problems learning to read and he's having uh, uh, difficulties paying attention in class and needs a lot of supervision to get his uh, work done. He can be disruptive in class and seems to pick fights with the teacher and the students. So there's many things I'm sure that are, go that are going through your mind right now. Uh, so certainly some of the things that you could be thinking are, um, is this attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? Does he have a learning disorder? And then, and then more broadly, how has his previous school experience affected his current situation? Do we know what kind of schooling he had in Colombia, or perhaps he didn't even have any schooling? And then, how has trauma really affected him? Is, is the, has the trauma affected him so badly that he has a post-traumatic stress disorder? Is he depressed with his current situation? Many, many things going to go through your mind or, uh, you know, as a clinician or as a provider in a, in a pediatric-based hospital. And the question is really how to start. So before we start, it's probably very important to actually go over definitions so that we understand the scope of the issues that we're going to be talking about. Specifically, newcomers to Canada are put into two different large categories, and those would be permanent residents or temporary residents. Within the permanent resident uh, category, there's family class residents, economic immigrants, government assisted refugees, uh, privately sponsored refugees, and a hodgepodge other category. Within the ter temporary resident category, there's refugee claimants, foreign students, temporary foreign workers, and humanitarian cases. So year on year, we have um, a lot of immigrants and refugees and newcomers to Canada. Approximately 250,000 individuals become permanent residents in Canada. And uh, this is the latest data that we have from 2011. And if you see that uh, this number has changed over time with more and more economic migrants and fewer family class immigrants arriving. However, uh, what's important to note is that 20% that 20 of these new permanent residents are children less than 15 years of age. And that really reflects what is the demographics of Canada. Where do they settle? Well, they settle in Ontario, Quebec, uh, British Columbia, but they really settle everywhere across our great, um, can great um, country, Canada. And uh, not only into smaller areas, uh, but also uh, into the larger um, towns and cities. This is the beautiful um, city of Whitehorse, the Yukon. In the summer, as you would understand, uh, there's no snow on the, on the ground uh, in this picture, but there's a lot more snow right now. And even in this smaller, uh, smaller uh, area, uh, in 2011, there were uh, 218 permanent residents um, that, that settled into this smaller town. So uh, this is not an area, this is not an issue only of uh, large centers, of which there's a significant uh, proportion, but it also is an issue of uh, smaller areas. Where do people come from to Canada? Uh, well, it depends on what uh, kind of area, area, you know, category you're talking about, but permanent residents, um, a significant proportion from Philippines, China, and India, United States, United Kingdom, and uh, to a lesser extent, many other countries. Refugee can uh, claimants, significant proportion from Hungary, uh, China, Colombia, Pakistan, and then uh, uh, multiple different other countries of which there's smaller percentages. And then the language of origin. So uh, Tagalog, uh, the, the language that's spoken in the Philippines, uh, Arabic, Mandarin, English, Spanish, Punjabi, French, and uh, Creole. 
But probably what's more important for you as a provider for health care for uh, children and youth new to Canada is their language ability. And so although they come with, uh, they come with multiple different languages and enrich our country, um, they also have uh, English skills in about 58% of the times, uh, French skills in about 6%, English and French in 10% of, uh, uh, of the group. But what's very concerning is that in about 25%, neither do they have English nor do they have French skills. And we know that um, that language is significantly associated with health healthcare utilization, but also healthcare uh, uh, fluency. We'll quickly jump to tuberculosis, and um, I'll get back to why I'm going to be talking about tuberculosis in a second in the next slide. But this is tuberculosis in Canada uh, by origin from 1987 to 2007. And so if you see on the y-axis, there's percentage of cases. And then on the x-axis, there's a year from 87 all the way to 2007. This is Public Health Agency of Canada data. And if you see um, that uh, Canadian-born Aboriginal uh, uh, population has a significant proportion, up, up to about 20% of all TB cases. And then non-Canadian-born uh, non-Aboriginal cases have decreased over time. But what, you've, what you're seeing is reflection of the global TB epidemic is that more and more foreign-born uh, people have tuberculosis disease, up to 60 to 70 percent of times. And so there's a significant increased risk of disease within uh, the first five years of arrival. And um, Patients who are born from outside of Canada have more likely to have resistant tuberculosis. So again, why are we talking about tuberculosis when we're talking about uh, language skills? Michael Gardam, uh, out of the uh, University Health Network in Toronto, who's a uh, infectious disease physician, uh, published a very interesting and um, and um, study that is very revealing. This is the one-year survival of foreign-born active tuberculosis patients based on patient-provider language concordance, concordance or discordance. So on the y-axis, you see survival probability going from 0.85 um, to all the way to 1. And on the x-axis, you see survival in time of months. So at one year, if you see way over to the, to the far right-hand side, and the, the dotted red line, if you're concordant in, in your communication and you both spoke English, then you know somewhere around 97, 98% of, of people actually survive active, active tuberculosis. If you have concordant communication and it's not English, say it's Spanish. So the healthcare provider can speak uh, Spanish to, to the person who only is a Spanish speaker. It's not as good, it's about 94%. But if you have discordant communication, so uh, if the healthcare provider can speak English or French, uh, but uh, the, um, the patient can only speak, say, Mandarin, uh, then you can see that there is a significant decrease, one-year survival of active tuberculosis treatment in Canada. So we're not talking about in a developing world or somewhere else, we're talking about a 10% decrease in survival only at one year based on patient provider language at discordance. So going back to another case, uh, this is Yemen, who's a 16-month-old uh, girl who's born in a refugee camp in Thailand. Her family was originally from Myanmar and then uh, arrived in Red Deer when she was seven months of age. Her mother had no routine prenatal care, and over the past two weeks, Yemen has not been feeding very well. She has a cough and a low-grade fever. She's not gaining weight, and she has a temperature of 38.5 degrees um, uh, uh, axillary. She's tachypnic with a respiratory rate of 60 breaths per minute, and you auscultate her chest, and, and there's fine crackles. Not only that, on the physical examination, you, you detect an enlarged liver and spleen and enlarged cervical uh, lymph nodes. So you, you ask yourself, is this a routine viral pneumonia or should we be talking about uh, the MERS coronavirus or SARS virus or something else? You also have heard 
that um, there's high rates of sexual violence in refugee camps. And could uh, the mother have HIV, and this is really the first sign of perinatal transmission of HIV? And so you also ask yourself, as part of the process of coming to Canada, did the mother or even the child actually get tested for HIV? When you look into things for a little further, uh, you do some more testing on Yemen, uh, you, and you do some more questioning, you uh, find out that both parents are actually to, were told that they tested positive for HIV before arriving into Canada. And um, K's, uh, sorry, Yemen's uh, test, HIV test subsequently comes back as positive. So this is not a routine viral pneumonia. This is an opportunistic infection related to HIV. Which brings up the issue about uh, before the, uh, people come to Canada, what do they get and uh, what should you expect? So what people usually get uh, for uh, a permanent resident is the Immigration Medical Examination or IME. Um, it is only used to assess danger to the public health, danger to public safety, and excessive demands on health or social services. So somebody with um, HIV is not routinely excluded from Canada, um, and somebody with active tuberculosis can be uh, temporarily excluded from Canada until they get tuberculosis under uh, control or under treatment because uh, we do not uh, because of this issue of danger to public safety. What's important to note is this immigration medical examination or IME is not really focused on the health of the child or the adult. It's really talking about public health and excessive demands on healthcare services. So it, it has mandatory testing uh, for urinalysis in children less than five, year, five years or older a checks to x-ray in children 11 years of age and older, in HIV testing in children 15 years of age and older. So many um, people will not have had a testing, uh, specifically children, uh, looking for tuberculosis, nor would they have testing specifically for HIV. And even if they saw a physician, it really is not uh, with the lens of assessing whether or not they're healthy or not, but it's for the issue associated with um, uh, danger to public health for Canada. Another case, this is Fatima, who's age four, who comes to your office for because of increasing uh, urinary accidents and incontinence, and then also she's complaining of some vague uh, abdominal discomfort. As part of your workup, you request a urinalysis and a culture and perhaps some sort of imaging such as an abdominal ultrasound. Fatima's parents asked you to see her 12-year-old sister, Rashmi, uh, for fatigue and heavy periods. Um, and you receive Fatima's reports, but Rashmi's investigations are missing. So you ask the parents about uh, uh, why that is so, and you learn that the parents, the girls' parents, are in Canada on work visas and uh, provincial permits, but uh, and they're applying for immigration uh, status. Fatima was born in Canada and has provincial health care coverage. However, Rashmi was born in Sri Lanka, came to Canada with her parents at six years of age. She does not have provincial health care insurance, and her family cannot afford investigations for her. So this really brings up this issue about barriers to care. And barriers to care really kind of fall in three large categories, one being systematic. And so the, in, in her situation, there's eligibility and entitlement to health care. So uh, there's they, they, um, their older sister does not have uh, health care coverage. Not only that, uh, there's a lack of care provider knowledge and skills. So if uh, the physician in uh, Red Deer doesn't understand about the specific cultural practices or the specific uh, healthcare beliefs associated with the family, then they're going to provide. Uh, they're, they're gonna, it's a barrier to healthcare um, healthcare um, access and also healthcare um, overall. There sometimes can be lack of familiarity with the Canadian healthcare system. Um, many different healthcare systems uh, differ across the world. Uh, they might have limited pre-arrival healthcare, 
and there could be precarious finances. So it might, although there might be health care coverage, they might not be able to take time off work. They might not be able to uh, afford uh, going over uh, to the lab after coming to the clinic uh, to, to get testing done. Not only that, that but there is a, um, a mistrust of government. In, in many countries around the world, the government is associated with abuse and torture or detention. They might have separated the family, and so there is ongoing uh, mistrust of the government. And when they learn that the health care is provided in Canada by the government, there is concerns and mistrust, and, and they're not willing to become forthright and tell you everything associated with their health care. Not only that, there's language, literacy, and cultural barriers. And so sometimes there's stigmatization and shame related to some healthcare conditions. We see that a lot with mental health care issues. There can be complex family dynamics. And then just an overall different understanding of disease. And then certainly we, we already uh, brought up the issue about how language and concordance of language really affects uh, health care and is a is a true barrier to uh, care. Culture not only uh, influences health, but it uh, can be a very dynamic uh, pattern. And so culture is a pattern of idea, customs, and behaviors shared by a particular people or society. And it's, it's a constantly evolving um, phenomenon. It's a shared phenomenon. And what's learned is passed on over generations to generations and in between uh, generations. So to give you an example, I'll give you two different uh, 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 children that, that, uh, that you could potentially see. So Miriam is a 10-year-old Sudanese girl who lived for three years as the less cared for child with an aunt who had four other children. Her mother, a, a Sudanese journalist, was persecuted and jailed after having written politically sensitive articles in a national newspaper. One night, her mother suddenly arrived to take the child away under the cover of darkness and they walked all night and slipped across the border. Once across, they lived in a refugee camp for two years, facing various difficulties because they had no male fa family member to protect them. Eventually, with assistance from the United Nations High Committee Commission for Refugees and the Canadian government, they made their way to Canada as government-assisted refugees. The mother has since been diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder, and though she's being treated, she has difficulty functioning in a day-to-day -day, uh, manner and adapting to life in Canada. The daughter, Miriam, actually quickly became her mother's interpreter and caregiver, and she appeared well-adapted, did well in school, was motivated to help her mother, smiled and smoked easily, and was very intent on learning English. However, no one really thought to ask her how she dealt with her own story. Contrast that with Rita, who's a 10-year-old daughter of a Sudanese school teacher in a wealthy area of Khartoum, who left the country with her mother under the protection of a diplomat during a stable period. This diplomat had arranged visas to Germany, provided a car with a diplomatic license plates and a skillful driver who drove them to the safest airport. There they boarded a small plane that connected to a prearranged flight to Frankfurt, Germany. The mother and daughter lived for two years in Frankfurt, the child was attending school while her mother worked as a tutor. They rented a room from a friend and ultimately they decided to migrate to Canada to uh, join extended family in uh, Toronto who sponsored them. The mother uh, remarried after arriving in Canada. So as, as you can see, although they might share geography and some culture, the trajectory differs considerably and is quite dynamic. And their access to health care, their utilization of health care, and overall health really differs considerably. And so that's why uh, we've, we've really only begin to scrape the surface of these many complex issues that can affect uh, children and youth who are new to Canada. And so many like-minded clinicians have been uh, working behind the scenes um, in an informal way and we, we'd be happy to uh, present to you through a long gestational period uh, with a tremendous f funding and support from Citizen Immigration Canada. Uh, the Canadian Pediatric Society has uh, blazed its way uh, forward in developing our unique bilingual free online resource or, and electronic book. We're, we're very excited to share with you this tremendous resource 
that will help you in providing optimal care for newcomers to Canada. So I'm happy to turn this presentation now over to Tony to share with you the process of the development of the resource and how to use it. Tony. All right, th well, thank you, uh, Dr. Huey. And before we go over to uh, Dr. Berezino, and while he's uh, getting his uh, papers in order and ready to present, uh, why don't we do those, uh, those few poll questions uh, before we get started with his section? That sounds great. All right. So uh, for those of you who have done a poll with us before, it's uh, the same process. You'll see the question pop up on the screen, and we just ask you to uh, click the screen and make your selection. So the first uh, couple questions are just going to be uh, about helping us understand who it is out there in the audience. Uh, so we're just asking which of the following best describes you. Are you a physician, a nurse, hospital administrator, allied health professional, or, or other? And it looks like uh, most of the uh, audience is allied health professionals or other, uh, and then uh, followed by nurses, hospital administrators, and we have no physicians online, so there you go. And, and I think the other, uh, I think many of them, just knowing our, our historical audience, there's many child life specialists, there'll be many uh, family and patient uh, representatives on, on the line as well, so I would guess that, that's, uh, that two, those two groups would represent a lot of those others. Uh, the next question uh, we're going to ask is, uh, have you ever visited the Caring for Kids New to Canada website before? Just a yes or no question. And it looks like 26%, uh, so quite a few have uh, visited the site before, but 74% have not visited the website before. And uh, a little bit about your healthcare, uh, your, your work in healthcare. For those of you who do work in healthcare, we're just asking you to think about uh, the children and youth that you see in a clinical setting. What proportion of them are recent immigrants or refugees? And if you're an administrator, feel free to think about your, your institution as a whole and what percentage um, would be considered immigrants or recent immigrants or refugees. And I know many of you are, as I mentioned, are family workers, so do, you do not do clinical work. but. We're looking for, uh, you know, is it less than 10% of the popula of your patient population? Is it tw 10 to 25%, 25 to 50, or more than 50% uh, would, be, would be new immigrants or, uh, or refugees? And it looks like, uh, you can see there, 35% are, uh, would estimate 10 to 25% of their patients are, uh, are new immigrants or refugees. 30% uh, would say less than 10%. Um, so a few out there, 10% saying 25 to 50, and only 10% saying more than 50% of their patients are, are refugees. So, so we'll hide that, uh, and then we will... So whenever you're ready, go ahead, Dr. Berezino. Changing gears a little bit here, um, as I will be uh, attempting to walk you through a little bit of the, the process of uh, development of the Caring for Kids New to Canada web resource. Um, as Chuck was saying before, th this has really been a labor of love for both of us, uh, one that we're very proud of, and we think that it's both timely and important to healthcare practitioners across Canada right now. Uh, but we also want to give thanks to uh, all of our team members, um, you know, support staff, editorial team, uh, reviewers, uh, audience members who provided reviews in the past uh, for making this uh, possible. Um, this is our uh, screenshot of our homepage, which hopefully by the end of today you'll be very familiar with and you'll want to visit. And uh, obviously uh, the most important question is why did we undertake this project? And hopefully uh, given the audience that we have, we can all agree on the importance of improving equity of access to quality health care which will hopefully lead to better health outcomes for immigrant and refugee children and youth. Um, but, but ultimately, this project is really meant to support the work that all of you do to achieve that in your day-to-day -day work and on the front lines uh, um, in, your, in your clinical work and your administrative uh, avenues. Uh, Chuck has already alluded to the fact that it's a free, bilingual, evidence-based, and peer-reviewed tool. Um, it has lots and lots of information, which hopefully we can go through a little bit today, as well as tools, checklists, and guidelines for primary healthcare professionals. Um, but it doesn't stop at primary healthcare professionals. The intent is to also have access that will uh, engage uh, administrators, uh, public health individuals, physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, whomever it may be who has an interest in the healthcare of children and youth new to Canada. This is um, just a, an attempt to give the audience an understanding of the project itself. Um, it has been a multi-year project. In fact, uh, we're into um, the fourth year overall, uh, if you include the, the beginnings uh, of the need assessment and, and soon into the fifth. Um, as you can see, the, the 
project itself has evolved over time with input from both subject experts and audience members. Um, it tends to utilize a very iterative development with next stage planning based on feedback. And the dissemination that we've tried to accomplish has been in multiple forms, um, everything through existing networks, um, presentations at things like these webinars and conferences, uh, publications, as well as other channels used by our target audiences. Um, and just to give you a sense of the time required for this project, the needs assessment alone took approximately six months. The funding search took us about uh, 18 months. And thank you again to the CPS, uh, the Canadian Family uh, Physicians Association, as well as the Citizenship and Immigration Canada. And then from development of infrastructure to the first e-publication was approximately 18 months. Um, now we have another 11 months or so left under this funding model and five months of which is content development and the final six months hopefully will be development of a sustainability plan. Uh, but from first germination to completion, it will be close to five years of hard work for many people across the country. Now the content development itself, you know, we know that from studies on knowledge exchange that knowledge itself is, is more likely to be useful when it's relevant to practice, when it's delivered in a timely fashion and it's sensitive to the local context and the, the care providers themselves. And so the CKNC group has, has tried to use a very cyclic process to develop, to develop the content. The phases that, that you can see here include um, input from the field itself and from uh, uh, individuals in positions to provide uh, information and guidance, uh, planning, uh, publication of, of, of uh, content once research and synthesis has, has uh, been completed, and then again more feedback emphasizing a, an ability to be responsive and flexible. Uh, and again we know from knowledge exchange um, literature that uh, the exchange of knowledge is, is in and of itself a process. Um, so the dissemination and the knowledge, the pages of the website, for example, are not really the end point. Uh, the, the point is to help uh, exchange knowledge and drive changes in practice or improvements in practice. And we hope that the iterative development and the active dissemination will allow us to do that in a, in a timely fashion. Now, there are downsides to being this collaborative and iterative. One is that it takes a lot of resources and time. Uh, and another is that it can be a little bit more difficult to control in the sense that, you know, the more flexible and iterative we are, the more unpredictable the outcome sometimes can be. All you have to do is think of Wikipedia to, to get an example of that. Uh, but overall, we feel that it has strengthened our ability to, to engage with our communities, and, and we hope that the end product online is, uh, is uh, reflective of that. Now the collaborations themselves, I've already mentioned the CPS, the College of Family Physicians, the um, the uh, Citizenship and Immigration Canada, and we thank them all for their uh, involvement. Uh, but the people on the ground, as you can see, are numerous. Um, the editorial board itself, made up of many, many individuals from across the country, uh, represent nine medical specialties, uh, multiple disciplines from public health, nursing, administrators, uh, physicians, pediatricians, family doctors. They're representatives from 15 different hospitals and uh, academic health science centers and seven provinces. Um, the, the peer reviewers uh, also have been uh, a huge and important component of our work. Um, 32 members from the CPS committee, subcommittees and sections and 32 external reviewers who've done the, the bulk of the legwork at looking at content that's been developed. About 70% um, have been pediatricians with the remainder being family physicians, nurses and allied health professionals. And the review po process for the content was really modeled after the Canadian Pediatric Society process for reviewing a position statement. So, so quite rigorous um, with at least experts from the subject matter, uh, two, uh, one from the CPS and one externally, um, someone with expertise in immigrant and refugee health, as well as representatives from the target audience. And we think that this has allowed us to have a very robust uh, review of the information and hopefully uh, it's, uh, it's it well received. As well, we've been fortunate enough to have many audience reviewers. We originally were looking at 15, uh, 12 to 15 audience reviewers who were going to be our guinea pigs, so to speak. And in the end, we had 51 um, volunteers who offered to look, test drive the site, so to speak. Uh, about a third were pediatricians, a third family doctors, and a third were nurses uh, or nurse practitioners. And uh, with their help, we've been able to fine tune the results of our web resource and hopefully make it uh, more user friendly. Now, 
the website itself is really the primary dissemination mechanism for this project, but it's really not the only one. Um, we know that studies of knowledge exchange tell us that we're more likely to achieve change in practice when the products we create are part of a larger strategy. Um, and so we've included active dissemination through web pages, uh, toolkits, uh, uh, conferences, events like this one, uh, networking within uh, uh, various uh, subgroups, uh, Canadian Family a Physician Forum, for example. Um, and basically, wherever we've been allowed, we've uh, taken the tack that we would love to do a dog and pony show, and Chuck and I are available at any point to flog the, the, uh, the value of our site. Um, and some of our volunteers have promoted the site also through their own networks, uh, everything from Twitter to web links to listserv announcements, and we've uh, had presentations from downtown Toronto all the way to Melbourne, Australia. Um, and the goal is really to expand our partnerships with other organizations and to sort of have a, an expanding web of uh, dissemination that will uh, incorporate more and more individuals coming to the site and hopefully using it on a long-term basis. Now, many things went well uh, during this KTE project. Um, certainly, we cannot under um, appreciate the, the volunteerism that was involved with many, many volunteers. Uh, reviewers themselves, 88% of those approached uh, agreed to participate. And as previously mentioned, the audience reviewers uh, were, were hugely helpful when we did the original soft launch. Um, the editorial collaboration, there were almost 40 meetings or teleconferences held over the 24 months of content development, and uh, the attendance remained high throughout. And we, in fact, uh, you know, estimated that uh, the volunteer in-kind contribution was over 300% of what we originally forecast. Um, the staff uh, supporting communications was phenomenal. Uh, the, we were fortunate enough to have funding for full-time project coordination as well as extensive support from the CPS communications team. And uh, we also used an online file sharing site where reference articles and content drafts could be pooled and accessed by anyone on the team and again uh, looked at, uh, be commented on. There were numerous phone-to-face meetings as well as several face-to-face -face conferences and meetings uh, over the course of the, the last uh, 24 months. And the content itself that we developed, um, I'll, I'll summarize later, but a lot of content as you'll see once we visit the site. Uh, it was more than double, in fact, the volume that they, we originally anticipated um, and uh, we're very proud of that. And budgeting, as much as we don't like to talk finances, it's still very important to keep in mind that uh, we were on a uh, relative shoestring budget despite the, uh, the uh, support that we were given. And we were able to maintain our uh, under budget uh, um, status at the close of each of the two fiscal years. So we're very proud of that. Now, there were also lots of challenges, uh, not the least of which was the fact that this is not a traditional uh, project. Uh, writing for a website is uh, not, uh, new to almost all of the individuals who are on the uh, editorial board and, and content development board. Uh, and certainly, it was different to have uh, medical writers act as the individuals who help smooth out the content and maintain a sense of, uh, of um, uh, consistency of style across the resource piece. And that wasn't always easy. Some individuals, as many of the physicians and, and nurses who were, uh, were volunteering to do this, had strong opinions as to how things should be uh, worded and or, uh, or developed. Um, but certainly over time, uh, we, we did have buy-in. And also, the, the approach itself, the evidence-based approach. Uh, we wanted it to be as rigorous as possible and as evidence-based as possible, but the content ranged significantly from topics with very high quality evidence, such as some of the infectious disease areas, to other areas with much less um, uh, evidence behind it, uh, for example, the influence on, of culture on health. And we used a method subcommittee to try to support the editorial board in their work, and uh, we even did a scoping review to try to find its high quality evidence on the health issues specific to immigrants and refugee children. And the reality was that very, very little was found in the pediatric realm, which spoke to the fact that uh, probably this is an area that requires uh, research in the future. Um, and finally, the, the intensity and the fact that it's multi-year. It's uh, very hard to keep uh, people motivated at the best of times, but yet when you're trying to motivate them for a project that can take three years uh, to come to the end, it's, it's quite uh, a significant amount of work. And, and kudos to, to Chuck and uh, the members of the CPS staff who've been able to maintain their, uh, their enthusiasm. 
many lessons were learned, uh, and I'm not going to go into these in de detail, but, you know, being flexible, communication, 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 and also, you know, taking into account that this, these types of projects take resources, time, experience, network funding, support, etc. But ultimately, we've resulted in some phenomenal output. Uh, 53 topics that have been developed to date, everything from acculturation to zinc deficiency. Uh, 30 more still in development, including some checklists and guidelines and e-tools. Over 11 combined publications and, and uh, presentations uh, internationally. And uh, in the first five months of uh, it being live online, over 10,000 unique visitors, um, which we, we are very proud of. So suffice to say that um, our, our, our feeling is, is that this project um, not just interesting from our perspective, has been very collaborative in nature, and we believe that in the end it has resulted in a very high quality and hopefully sustainable resource that will help improve the provision of health care to children in Canada. And the knowledge and uh, uh, translation and, and exchange will hopefully, the lessons learned, will, will help guide future similar endeavors. Now, I wanted to also take this opportunity now to kind of switch gears to um, look at the site itself. I'm using the medical assessment piece here predominantly as a way of accessing the site so that I can navigate around a little bit and show it off to all of you uh, online here. Um, I, you know, I'll talk very briefly about just some key points about the medical assessment of immigrant and refugee children, uh, in, in particular the pre-visit preparation and how to effectively communicate but I'll really use this as a launching point to uh, get into the website itself and look at things like the medical assessments some general issues, um, as well as really the utilization of the, of the resource itself and hopefully convince you that uh, it's worthy of, uh, of a test drive. Now, you know, the key points when you're considering a medical assessment of immigrants and refugee children, I mean, for the most part, it's really not that different than the usual history and physical examination that individuals do in their offices and clinics every day. But there obviously are, must be subtle differences of focus and interaction and, and as well interpretation. Um, so getting to know a new immigrant or refugee obviously revol re requires that a thorough history and physical is done, but you really need to be sensitive to and aware of the cultural and language differences. We'll talk a little bit uh, or at least touch upon the need for um, trained cultural interpreters um, and the importance of that. And I think uh, in the, uh, the first slide or one of the first slides that Chuck uh, spoke to on the, on the outcomes for TB speaks to that uh, quite uh, loudly. Um, also, um, for some of these children, they have, may never have had a reliable, complete uh, health assessment, so you need to be on the lookout from, for everything from congenital anomalies to chronic diseases. And some of these chronic illnesses, if present, may not have been treated as adequately as uh, they may be uh, or we may consider them to be treated in, in uh, North America. And uh, there are also issues around diseases not usually seen in Canada. Um, be aware of different presentations uh, due to their cultural uh, and uh, and uh, timeline presentations. Beware also that it may take several appointments to, to initially complete your assessment. There may be a time when they come in with a specific um, issue per se that, that derails the original co concept of a first uh, evaluation and uh, there are times that you may even have an acute emergency that requires a child to be referred to hospital, for example, for an acute malarial uh, exacerbation. The initial medical assessment, again, no different than a full history physical, um, but often that first visit needs to be flexible. It, need, it may be targeted or it may allow you to be more general and, and fact-finding in nature. Um, ideally, from the perspective of, of safety, but also from the perspective of minimizing long-term harm, the, the evaluation should occur as soon as possible after arrival in the country, uh, which obviously leads to some issues from the perspective of insurance coverage. Um, but separate appointments also, if at all possible, need to be considered for each individual child. Again, not always a, an easy thing given that families may have difficulty um, if they are working or if they have uh, inability to provide child care to the other individuals in the family. And a little bit of preparation would be great. This is not always uh, what happens in real time, but certainly having the documents, uh, the pre-immigration screening results, the immunization records, growth charts, do uh, medical documents, etc., are useful. 
keeping in mind as well that they're not necessarily going to be accurate and they need to be um, um, interpreted with a grain of salt. Um, but also, who do you need in the room? Knowing the type of individual interpreter or settlement worker or, or family member who can be the real communicator uh, is an important thing if you want to maximize the information gathered from that first visit. In terms of communication, um, there's many things that, that come up. Uh, you know, clinical demeanor, you know, having a warm smile and a slow, gentle approach, making sure that perhaps you learn some greetings for the common languages that are seen in your clinic, uh, being respectful of the different culturals and the different types of greetings, including, you know, handshaking, uh, variations in, uh, in degree of eye contact, which culturally uh, can make a huge difference in terms of uh, setting the family at ease. Um, and also, the family dynamics. It's very, very important to know the role of each family member. Typically, with older children or adolescents, you may normally get the history directly from the child, but in certain cultures, it may be more appropriate, for example, to have a family uh, member, an elder, such as a father or grandparent, be the spokesperson, even though they may not actually know the uh, history as well, but have them be the spokesperson for the family. This will help in terms of building trust and in terms of uh, developing a real rapport. Knowing the immigration status, although important, is not always the be-all and end-all. Um, it will help you in terms of understanding uh, the journey taken, perhaps. But many families, in fact, may be reluctant to reveal their immigration status for fear that their medical illness may become known to authorities and may put them at risk of deportation. And usually this is a false assumption, but an, assu but an assumption that they carry around with them nonetheless. Um, so sometimes it's not important to know the immigration status as much as knowing do they know or do they need um, uh, any help in terms of sorting out their immigration status, offering it up as, a, as an opportunity to say, I, I don't need to know your status, but if there's anything I can do, would you, would you like me to help you out? And knowing a little bit of where their their background is, and also how they've gotten to where where they are, is it have they been in a refugee camp? It's not just where you've come, but it's how you've what you've experienced along the journey that sometimes makes a huge difference as to how to interpret uh, both the story that's being given to you and the potential risk for that child uh, who's sitting in front of you. And um, I'm just going to move on to the next stage here because I wanted to actually touch upon use of the actual website itself. So let's say, for example, the child in front of you is uh, a refugee, and you're not sure what the situation is from an insurance perspective. Um, so you go to the Caring for Kids website, and we actually have already, have already pre-migrated this to the health insurance section. And you might go down to your province, for example. You might say, look in Ontario, and it's woefully not that helpful to go to the Ontario website. I'll tell you that in advance, uh, especially for many of our families. But maybe it's more useful to say, well, what about families who are going to be on the interim federal health program? What if I try to get some information about that? You can then go to the IFP summary of benefits, And then from the summary of benefits, and I'm not going to make any political comment as to the IFHP uh, program other than to say that I'm not that happy with it, but you can go down and say who's got coverage, what kind of coverage, what constitutes urgent or essential coverage. And again, for working with uh, the family at the bedside, this may be a, a very useful way to come to the website and, and use it. But also you might say, hey, well, what about the family that I, we were talking about earlier who, uh, in the absence of an interpreter, um, might not do as well? So what does the, the brain trust of both CKNC and the CPS and CIC say about using interpreters in healthcare settings? So you might go over to the Using Interpreters webpage and the link, look down through it, finding an interpreter, use of untrained interpreters, and what, for example, are the, the risks and benefits of using untrained interpreters. And in fact, you might even go further down and find that we now have a, a tool that can be accessed. If I 
can get to it. Excuse me one second. There we go, hopefully. There we go. A checklist that is for use of interpreters with children, youth and children. And you may be able to check, uh, uh, print this off and keep on file in your office. And when an individual or a family comes in, um, it, it may be a useful resource to you. So just going back to the talk for a moment, when we move on a little bit further, starting into the actual history and physical itself. Um, again, I'm not going to go into detail other than to say that, you know, there are things that are different for the history and physical examination of children and youth new to Canada, uh, as is the case in the adult population. Everything from what the family's particular focus is and their perception of the, uh, the illness or complaint at hand, uh, issues around, for example, even the family history, the, the verification of a child's actual first and last name and appropriate spelling. Um, you know, knowing who the actual, uh, what the actual family unit is like, who is actually in Canada with them, and are there individuals who are still outside of the country waiting to come to the country, and how that has affected their uh, relationship and their uh, their situation. These are all issues that need to be taken to, into account when you have a child uh, or a, a youth in front of you with these uh, sorts of issues. The history also needs to take into account uh, the child's actual age. Uh, birth dates are not necessarily the same, interpreted in the same way depending on where you come from and not necessarily verifiable on immigration papers. Um, also. The, the journey, as previously mentioned, where were they raised, what was their country of origin, their tribal and migration history, um, you know, uh, how many countries have they been in prior to actually coming to Canada, and information around birth history which may or may not be available. So it's complicated, but if you actually, again, come to the website, there is a guide, the Medical Assessment of Immigrants and, and Refugee Children put together by one of our colleagues, Dr. Bob Hilliard from Sick Children's Hospital in Toronto, who's worked for many, many years in this field. And if you migrate down, you can look at everything from history taking to assessment of the psychosocial history, looking at, for example, post-traumatic stress disorder, as one of Chuck's cases was looking at earlier. When you go to post-traumatic stress disorder, you can look down and say, well, are there any differences, for example, in terms of their presentation? Right. Common symptoms, maybe there's differences in terms of the ages of the children in front of you. And you can use these uh, tables to help guide your questioning or your interpretation of the information that's been provided to you. But then also, what about how we discuss it? Is it different? Is the discussion of PTSD different with newcomers? And obviously there, there is some difference. Often the understanding or the cultural reaction to a diagnosis of such, uh, the translation uh, in terms of trying to uh, get the, co the concept of what PTSD is or means from the perspective of, an, of a developed world to a, an individual who's come from perhaps a developing country um, and how to, how to do it in a culturally competent way. So the hope would be that, you know, if not at the bedside, certainly after the, after the visit, an individual could go to this and use it to, to navigate through and pick out pieces of information that would help them do a better and more complete uh, job with uh, dealing with the families that they're uh, seeing uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm just going to skip through this very quickly to the end. We, we Apart from the, the history and physical examination, there are also screening investigations that sometimes need to be thought of. And um, I won't read through the list here. You can certainly look at that at, at your own leisure. Um, but again, going back to the website for a moment, we can see that there's actually health information by region or country as well as assessment and screening of this. And we've currently um, uh, have a link 
to um, the checklist that's been produced by the CCIRH, uh, which has um, uh, gone to great trouble to look at um, uh, issues and specific health-related issues uh, by region of, uh, of uh, origin. And uh, they have kindly allowed us to link to their center. And by going to those areas, uh, you can get information and or um, screening suggestions as to what, be it from physical, uh, infectious, or psychosocial issues, should be screened for. And our hope is also to further uh, define this uh, for our own group, and particularly for the, the pediatric uh, and adolescent population. So in, in closing, from the perspective of, uh, of our uh, web resource, I just want to hopefully uh, entice you to take a look at the resource uh, at your leisure. This has really been just a snippet of how the CKNC site can be incorporated into your day-to-day -day clinical practice, but also it can help from the perspective of hospital policy development, um, from public health policy development, from patient advocacy. There are components on there around advocacy and uh, support to family members who, uh, and families who have uh, immigrant and refugee status. And what I'm going to leave the last few minutes to Chuck to do is to, to try to give you food for thought as to how you can utilize the web, ser the web uh, resource moving forward in your own day-to-day -day practice and to make uh, differences uh, in your uh, local communities. So over to you, Chuck. Uh, Dr. Hewitt, do you need the uh, screen back over to you? Yes, please. All right, here it comes. And while uh, we're handing the screen back over, this is my chance to remind the audience to uh, type in your questions. If you have any questions, type them into the question box for us while uh, Dr. Huey is, uh, is finishing up his portion of the presentation, and we'll be happy to get some of your questions out to, the, uh, to our two presenters. So over to you, Dr. Huey. Okay, great. Uh, so um, we, we've heard about why um, there are significant complex issues associated with uh, children and youth new to Canada. Um, we also uh, went over, uh, Tony brought us along about the significant uh, progress we've made and uh, the, a lot of all the effort uh, that many people have, uh, have uh, put in to this web resource. And um, he gave you a quick uh, understanding of how to utilize the um, website. So what, what can you do? What, what are the concrete steps that you can do uh, in terms of a short, medium, and long-term uh, goals in terms of uh, implementing some of these uh, things at, at your various different sites? So uh, first off, as, as Tony was mentioning, this is an this is an opportunity for us to present this information so that you can uh, further disseminate it to the frontline workers, really. So that would be uh, ambulatory care clinics, inpatient units, educators, and managers. So please send um, on uh, the, the website, the electronic uh, resource, electronic book to them. And um, as Doug was saying, the um, webinar is available to them so that they can uh, get a better sense of how to utilize uh, the website. Um, and also, um, as was mentioned by uh, Tony, uh, there are two checklists that are pro uh, very helpful uh, for you uh, when you're seeing uh, people new to Canada. And that would be the use of the interpreter's checklist and also uh, the taking a medical history checklist. So these are, you know, as easily, we've, we've trialed them in terms of ease of use and uh, functionality. Um, so please uh, utilize these as much as you can. Again, this is a free online bilingual uh, website, so you, in both official languages we have all these checklists available. Median term, we actually are developing, as was alluded by Tony, an electronic checklist. So perhaps, uh, you know, in the, in the next few months, uh, probably getting into the spring, you'll be able to uh, see uh, the electronic checklist um, that you can go to so that it, you don't have to utilize it in a paper form um, and is a comprehensive uh, checklist that, 
that uh, can help you in assessing um, and ensuring that you haven't forgotten things or things haven't kind of fallen through the cracks. Uh, so that's one of the things that we have uh, coming down the pipeline. Um, and certainly, as was mentioned, um, there are many other briefs and chapters in, in our electronic book that are coming up all the time and please come back to the site uh, often uh, to, to ensure that you um, are kept up to date of what is available. We also have uh, a, a, you know social media um, sites that uh, you can link into uh, that would keep you up to date on those things. Long term, what can you do? Well, it, it really kind of focuses uh, in around the area of advocacy and advocacy in multiple different realms. So we 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 didn't really want to get into this issue of IFH, but really the, this is a huge issue that's ongoing right now. And so uh, the Canadian Pediatric Society, as have many other uh, professional bodies such as the CMA, uh, College of Family Physicians, um, the, uh, the College of Pharmacists, um, uh, CAFC has come out, uh, that said they have been against the IFH changes. And we would suggest that at least reinstatement of the coverage of women and children would be appropriate, if not total revamp of the whole system of IFH. And so that's something that you can work on the ground level and speak to uh, you know, your local hospital, speak to your local political representatives in terms of IFH coverage because it really does impact in terms of having no prenatal care, having uh, you know significantly impacts the health of the infant, at uh, the neonate and the infant and the children down down the line. So there are significant uh, concerns associated with the IFH changes. Coverage of interpretive services, as you know, interpretive services are very patchwork uh, um, uh, funding across Canada and uh, many different uh, jurisdictions do not have any coverage and uh, is utilized within the budget of the hospital and so um, it would be important to advocate for in your local area, your provincial, your territorial area uh, for coverage of these interpretive services which are crucial as we've outlined um, in terms of the overall health care uh, of uh, newcomers or people who are who've been here for some period of time that just don't have the language skills for us to tell them about uh, it, the importance of adherence of antiretroviral therapy for an HIV uh, po a positive uh, patient for chronic care. The Canadian Pediatric Society is taking a leadership posi uh, position and we're uh, in the midst of developing a position statement on the use of interpretive services and specifically stating that it is harmful for the use of a child as an interpreter of an older of an adult or a family member. It is not in the best interest of the child, nor is it in the best interest of the adult uh, or in the best interest of the healthcare system at all, as a whole to have a child interpret that for them. It's important to, to continue to uh, push the idea of research into newcomers to Canada. And so, uh, you know, we, we have a lot of research and a lot of funding in many different areas, uh, but this is, a, this is one of those areas that's been quite neglected. And then uh, finally, it's important to engage in your local community and uh, develop these regional specific solutions. Although we, you know, we have a lot of information and a lot of uh, resources that you can link to that are, 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 can be specific to your area, uh, there might be some uh, different uh, specific to your area, specific to your clinic, specific to your hospital, specific to your catchment area, uh, solutions that you might want to uh, implement uh, when you engage the local community and find out uh, that there's a certain issue that needs to be dealt with. And then uh, on that note, uh, it would be important to develop a policy um, uh, in your local area um, with regards to the health care of uh, children and youth uh, that are new to Canada. So those are the long term, the short term, the median term, and the long term uh, issues that you can do to help uh, ensure that the, the children and youth new to Canada are getting the optimal health care. So 
really um, I'd like to end up by again reiterating that this um, this project that's been extraordinarily interesting and collaborative, as was mentioned by Tony, um, is really the end result of um, a lot of people um, and is a high quality uh, sustainable resource um, that we hope that you will continue to use. And uh, this is just a snapshot of uh, the editorial board uh, that we would like to celebrate the work of all these people who are, uh, you know, working uh, tirelessly on our project. Um, but there are many people behind the scenes, in, in addition to some people who might be on the call right now, uh, who are passionate reviewers and content developers, is really because of their phenomenal work uh, that we have such a great and a resource, uh, and a useful resource. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your participation. We'd be happy to take any uh, questions. And perhaps, um, uh, Doug, uh, we could just put up the last uh, polling survey question, um, and then we'd be happy to take questions. Sure. No, that's absolutely possible. Uh, so as you can see on the screen now, uh, we have our last qu poll question of the day. After what you've heard today, how useful do you think the Caring for Kids New to Canada website would be in your work? Uh, very useful, somewhat useful, not very useful, or not applicable at all to my work, or so you're still not sure. So let us know what you uh, what you think, uh, how useful you think this site might be to your to your daily work following this. Uh, the good news is that no one has says that has said that it's not applicable. Uh, there's a few of uh, a small percentage that are not sure, but the vast majority are uh, more than 50 53 percent said very useful and 41 percent said somewhat useful. I think uh, I'd say that's positive. We did have a, a, we do have a few questions uh, that have come in now. Uh, the first question is from uh, Julia and she's saying she's a child children's mental health uh, she works at a children's mental health center in, in the Peel region. She says that new immigrants and refugee families often have difficulties accessing psychiatric care for their youth beyond the initial psychiatric assessment because of the lack of medical coverage. Is there a resource within the website that helps them to know where to direct families for this type of care as the lack of insurance is a barrier to the to the to psychiatric care? Right. Um, um, Tony, I wonder if you can take that on. I can I can. Uh go to the um, mental health section and kind of uh, navigate it through that, but uh, specific to the Peel area, I don't know if you have any um, specific expertise. Yeah, so I mean the hope is that uh, we are still populating the web resource with resource uh, linkages. Um, so currently, um, off the top of my head, I can't recall exactly uh, what has been uh, uploaded already, but um, our mental health uh, content leads, uh, Dr. Morley Beiser and Dr. Daphne Korczyk, um have done great work in uh, developing initially just content around the, the various um, types of uh, mental health challenges in, seen in this population, um, but uh, as well um, links to both uh, national and uh, provincial uh, supports and resources. Local supports become more difficult because um, in terms of managing that, this is where the iterative, iterative process will be useful for us in an ongoing uh, basis because it really, as you said, uh, or as you alluded to in your question, there's a huge uh, difference in terms of access and, and, um, and uh, opportunities based on where you may be locally. So we are looking to our audiences and looking to our local experts to try to help populate uh, the resource list. And it's not limited to mental health. It's, it's similar f uh, for some of the, the uh, other uh, broad-based, uh, particularly things like public health development uh, and behavioral issues, uh, many of which uh, also are challenges, uh, whether you're in an urban setting or, uh, or uh, a non-urban setting. So I, I just... Uh chime in here and so uh, we're on the Caring for Kids New to Canada website again and so not only do we have uh, four different uh, areas that we have uh, uh, chapters on depression and post-traumatic stress disorder, child development issues and assessment and development of disability across cultures but now uh, we're on beyond the clinic and we have community resources and we've kind of uh, put them into different silos and there will be national different um, 
uh, resources. And so with regards to mental health, so there's Multicultural Mental Health Resource Center, and of which they you know, link to multiple different organizations that uh, provide access to interpreters and cultural brokers. And then, um, you know, uh, there's a list of, of uh, psychotherapists by language in which they work. Um, and then so then we also go down to the provincial uh, um, spots. And then if you we're going down to um, uh, Ontario specifically, uh, there's some settlement organizations uh, in my language. Um, again, depending on what it is. Um, and then you know, to the Durham region, Hamilton, London, um, and then uh, Peel uh, area. Here are some resources specific uh, to to, to uh, specific to the Peel area. So um, we we try to keep this uh, as much to, up to date as possible. And again, we can't um, emphasize as much enough that. Uh, it was only as good as um, the feedback that we get, and if you have other resources that you think are are important to to put up there, we'd be happy to um, we're happy to take a look. The comment in the uh, in one of the questions that somebody mentioned that something was out of date. So uh, uh, as as Dr. Huey just said, just feel free to contact them, and they will do their best to to make sure it is up to date. Um, one of our questions uh, has come in from Katie, who's one of our colleagues out in Edmonton, and uh, she has uh, she's taken a quick look at the site as uh, during the presentation. Says it looks excellent, even in the limited time she's had to spend on it. Um, she says it's very. It looks like its community community resources are very human focused. Uh, unless she's not looking in the right spot, she says she doesn't see too much uh, community continuing healthcare resources. And she's asking, is there a desire to have any of that information available, or is the focus to stay more human services focused? Sorry, Doug, did you say human focused? Yeah, human services focused uh, versus, uh, I think she's saying, Katie, feel free to type in a clarification in case we're misinterpreting your question, but um, I think she's saying, uh, so, so the question is, I'll just read it again. She's saying community resources are very human services focused, and she's seeing not seeing much in the health community continuing care resources, uh, much in the way of health community or continuing care resources I'm not quite sure I really understand the question I don't know Tony if you really um, have a understanding of what the, the question means and Katie maybe, maybe you could clarify for us Katie what you mean by maybe community resources versus uh, human human services yeah, I mean maybe uh, and I don't want to misinterpret Katie's question but um, you know I'm not sure if, if Katie's concept is that right now it's sort of more medical healthcare focused but acute intervention as opposed to ongoing sort of uh, resource supports uh, in you know everything from public health to as the previous uh, question mentioned uh, supports for mental health supports for developmental services um, things like uh, you know community services settlement workers etc um, and if, if that is the question itself the answer is well we've done our, our, our best to to focus in initially on, on the content that is most frequently of issue and the drilling down to local levels becomes part of the next phase if there is a, a an ability to, to continue this on to the next phase because this is where uh, as many of the people who are probably online and know and certainly I, I would imagine myself and, and, and Chuck and anyone who works with uh, this population or, or any population of youth um, you know the the visit in the office is really just you know the beginning, and then they go back to their homes and their schools and their communities and uh, families and children, um, even with English as a first language, with means and with uh, you know ability to self navigate and advocate, sometimes struggle to find the appropriate resources. Um, let alone if you add the number of barriers that are faced by the immigrant and refugee population. So. Um, we can, at this stage, we've we've made the linkages at sort of national, provincial levels, but in order for it to be really util useful for individuals on the ground, obviously the, the, the more focused it becomes to their communities, the better it will be. 
and and this is one of the long-term goals. That's why the hope is that sustainability, and I'm just going to fly the sustainability flag a little bit because uh, we certainly don't want this to end on uh, September the 30th, 2014, which is kind of when our original funding runs out. Uh, we want to be able to make sure that this continues on in a format that will continue to grow and help support the people providing the care as well as, as potentially expand to supporting the families themselves. Right now you'll notice that this is meant to be accessed as is by healthcare providers, you know, teachers, uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, doctors, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, but the next logical question for us was, well, should there be a component or a way of also incorporating educational uh, components for families and, and ways that they can access their own uh, support in healthcare. So, you know, all I can say is uh, stay tuned. Hopefully, this will be uh, part of the the next developmental phases of the project. All right, thanks. And Katie did uh, comment that you. It does sound like you did answer her question, but you, you now that and she did post a, a bit of a follow up. She in the initial question, she did capitalize human services, capital H, capital S, and she says in Alberta, human services are like social are social services. So I think you did. Uh, you were you were able to answer the question. I think uh, accurately. <laughs> um, Great. So that um, and uh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry, it's uh, Chuck here, and uh, just to kind of follow up on uh, uh, Tony's points and Katie's uh, question, really, um, you know, not only do we provide information, but also provide information of how you can continue to advocate for uh, these patients. So, uh, you know, beyond the clinic, uh, you know, so we certainly talk about social determinants of health and how it affects uh, newcomers to Canada, uh, but also advocacy. Specifically, there could be uh, individual advocacy, advocacy at multi, you know, at a systems level, at a policy level, uh, and so how to go about doing that. You know, kind of a, uh, a you know Reader's Digest uh, approach about how to um, advocate uh, by a health pr practitioner. So. Uh, there might be specific small uh, issues that you need to work on um, in your individual area, uh, but that certainly uh, would be important, and, and we provide some resources to be able to do that. Um, and again, um, that would be beyond the clinic. We also talk about, uh, you know, the the, the barriers that we were mentioning about community resources, health insurance, using interpreters, uh, how cultural competence and um, tools and resources as we talked about and adaptation and acculturation in addition to the uh, kind of mainstream kind of like uh, uh, you know malnutrition, uh, iodine deficiency um, and all the other um, areas that are uh, equally important. And I don't see any other questions, so why don't we? Uh, uh, why don't I hand it over to uh, Dr. Huey and Dr. Berezino for your any final comments, any closing comments you'd like to make? Well, for my well again, uh, go ahead, Sorry, go uh, Tony. No, I, I just wanted to thank everyone again for their time and, and interest in our project. Um, I want to encourage uh, people to to, as I said, test drive the site. Um, your feedback is appreciated. You can certainly contact uh, Chuck or myself or um, people from the CPS support uh, office. Um, you know, the, the input will only make this better, and, and we hope that uh, it's something that can make a difference in uh, provision of care to children and, uh, and youth uh, new to Canada for years to come. So thank you. Yes, thank you very much again, um, and uh, thanks very much to uh, a lot to the Canadian Pediatric Society, which has shown a, a leadership role in this uh, in this area, and to all the reviewers and people who have contacted us and, and given us great feedback. It's very helpful. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you, uh, Dr. Huey and Dr. Berezino. I mean, that was a great presentation and very much in line with a lot of the uh, the type of content that our community is often very interested in. We had a, a presentation a number of months ago from Karima Carmeli and their cultural competencies program at Sick Kids, and I think this ties in nicely with that. And that webinar you can also find on the, on the Knowledge Exchange Network. So a couple of uh, real really good resources uh, available out there to help uh, those of you who are uh, dealing with uh, new immigrants and refugee refugee children, and lots of resources to help uh, improve 
their their care. So thank you again to, uh, as they said, to the Canadian Pediatric Society and, and Elizabeth Moreau for helping us pull this particular presentation together. And as I mentioned at the top of the presentation, this session was recorded uh, and everything will be up on the Knowledge Exchange Network in a couple days and everyone who registered for this webinar will receive an email. So thanks to everyone who joined us. We'd usually do these webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Uh, things will slow down a little bit as we get uh, to close to Christmas, but uh, things will pick up uh, again uh, in the new year, of course, and we hope to see everyone on any of our next webinars. So uh, if you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to contact us, and uh, thank you for joining us. Goodbye, everyone.